Are you getting blamed or made to feel responsible for everything that's wrong with your relationship? It's time to pinpoint the behaviors that are making you crazy. Visit loveandabuse.com, download the mean workbook, and find your way back to sanity. Are you annoyed by affirmations? Are you tired of that same old rehashed personal growth advice that all seems to boil down to think positively and all your problems will go away? If affirmations feel like lies and positive thinking feels like denial, then I want you to get ready. The Overwhelmed Brain is here to help you create the life you want now. Hello, welcome to The Overwhelmed Brain. My name is Paul Coliani, and this is the show where I help you tackle life's toughest challenges. I want to help you increase your emotional intelligence, strengthen your self-worth and self-esteem, and empower you so that you can make decisions that are right for you. Everything I talk about on this show is my personal opinion and is meant for informational and educational purposes only. Always consult a medical or psychological professional before making any changes that could affect your physical or mental health. All right, this is a, a good episode today. I'm going to say this not knowing if it's going to be one. <laughs> what I mean is it's going to be a good episode about second chances. Do you want to give someone a second chance? Are they worthy of a second chance? Is what you had together, if it's a romantic relationship or a friendship or a family member, is it worth a second chance? Do you want to try it out again? Because there might be something there worth saving or trying over. And uh, this is a very important question because there are people that come and go in our lives. And when they go, depending on how they went, we may or may not ever want to see them again. Usually with romantic relationships, but you know, friendships too. I've heard of many, many, many year friendships that have uh, reached a breaking point, And then the friends involved didn't want to reconnect because she said this about me and he said that and she said and he said and so it goes back and forth until you get to the point where you realize there's just irreconcilable differences and you can't get past it but what does it take to become the type of person that can actually come back to a relationship of some sort and be i don't know forgiven or taken back or be accepted and what do we look for in the person who does that? Like I remember my very first girlfriend, uh, she broke up with me. She didn't want anything to do with me. She, I don't know. She didn't tell me why she was breaking up. But in hindsight, I pretty much know why. I mean, I was not a very um, supportive person. And I was also very jealous and possessive. I was a teenager and I had a lot to learn, had a lot of dysfunction still going on back then, but she broke up with me and it was a good thing. I mean, for her, for me, I cried like a baby. I was in tears. And when I think, I don't know if it was a day or two later, she came over and I said, let me just talk to you. And while she was there, I cried even more and she felt so bad. She felt so sorry for me. And she may have even felt guilty. She may have thought, oh, what did I do? What did I do to him? And she decided that, okay, maybe we can try this again and see what happens. And I said, really? And we, we did. We got back together again. And for about two or three days, it was great. And then she decided to break up with me again. And it was awful. It was devastating. And for her, there was no going back. It's funny, I think about that time in my life and I remember who I was back then, at least parts of it. And uh, I certainly remember my behaviors. And these behaviors that I did to try to get her back are now ending up on a list that I'm here to warn you about. <laughs> They're now ending up, I mean, not all my behaviors. There's a lot of behaviors that involve that a lot of us have done or a lot of people have done to us that we need to know about. We need to know about the, the red flags of reconnecting with someone and is it going to be a good reconnect? Is it going to be a healthy thing to do? Or are we getting sucked back into some dysfunctional, toxic, or unhealthy relationship that we don't want to bring into our lives? Again, do we 
say yes to the reconnect. So that's what this episode's about. And it stems from an email that I'm going to pull up here and read to you. Um, where is it? Right here. This is from someone I'm going to call Mary. She says, I have been a faithful listener to your podcast for about a year now. I love the overwhelmed brain and so many of the podcasts have resonated with me. I wrote to you a while ago, but I thought I would write again as a lot has changed. I have been able to move on from my long-term relationship after our breakup. It's been very challenging and it's been tough. It's been several months, but I say I'm finally at peace with myself and who I am At the same time, I have built up my confidence again after a tricky and what I think was a toxic relationship. Anyway, here's the interesting part. Every time you mention your wife and how you behaved with her, your situation sounds so similar to mine. And I feel how I think your wife would have felt and my boyfriend behaved in a similar way as you. You say you've been able to use that situation to grow and move forward uh, with life and now you've found an amazing relationship with your current partner. So here's the thing. My ex has been in touch after us not speaking and going cold turkey for all this time. He seems to have grown up massively and acknowledges everything he did wrong, and he's done a huge amount of personal growth and work on himself, and I feel like he finally understands me and where our relationship went wrong. He seems really happy in his life now, and he has his own thing going on, whereas before... He relied on me too much for his happiness, and that was part of the problem. He became too controlling. We caught up for coffee, and we had some really good and meaningful chats. I actually can't believe his new outlook on life and the understanding he has. It's amazing. He wants to take me on a trip, no strings attached, to see if we can make it work and if there's a chance to go back to a new relationship. My question to you, Paul, is... Can he really have changed similar to how you have or did? Or do you think it's the fact that he is not with me, he's saying all the right things, etc. now? Do you think that we could go back to a new relationship, make it work now that he has done all this work on himself, or do you think it's not a good idea? I'm so torn and confused as to what to do. He is saying all the right things, and I know he truly loves me, but it's so hard to trust again that we would slip into that same toxic relationship. If you have any advice from being in the similar situation, please, I would be most grateful. All right. Thank you, Mary. Thank you for sharing that and for asking that question. And you wrote before, and I didn't get a chance to answer that email yet. So I'm glad to get this update, and I'm glad I'm answering it before your trip. I don't usually get to emails this quickly, but I got to yours. So let's address this. I'm actually going to go over a list of all all the things you should look for when you are reconnecting with someone. I think this is going to be helpful for anyone listening with any relationship where they've disconnected with the person in some way, Uh, especially for romantic relationships, but this does work for friendships and family and things like that. If there's been any type of falling out, if there's been any type of breakup, any type of disconnect, this is the show for you if you have any thought of getting back into a relationship a connection, a friendship, a family connection uh, again. And this will help you understand if it's a good move back into the relationship or if there are already red flags during the reconnection, reuniting phase. So Mary, this is going to be very helpful for you. And um, in the next segment, I'll go over a list of uh, 10 things to look for. What I want to say right off, however, Mary, is A, There's a lot of green flags in what you're saying. There's a lot of good things about what I hear. I'm a little concerned that you'll be taken away and isolated from probably friends and family, I'm assuming. Unless he's taking you somewhere with friends and family, that might be a different thing. But if he's taking you away to a place where you're isolated from everyone, I'm not a big fan of that, especially after having a toxic relationship. And the first time you're actually going to try to work on your relationship, you're going to be isolated. That doesn't make me feel very good. There, you know, I won't, I won't say that's a red flag. I'm going to say it's an orange flag because it is quite possible that he has gone through all these improvements and he's gone through a lot of self-healing and he's going to show up as, you know, 
the man he is today. Hopefully not pretending to be a perfect gentleman, but he is a perfect gentleman. He, maybe he is a, a great guy now and he knows his toxic behavior and he has worked on that toxic behavior or is still working on it. Um, but I, I would rather see that happening in a non-isolated place where you can actually build the relationship slowly. Because when you're taken away and isolated, there's also a great chance for fast intimacy. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> there's, there's a great chance for fast intimacy. You may want that. I'm not holding that back from you. You can absolutely want that and it would be absolutely okay, except fast intimacy doesn't create the incremental buildup that might need to happen after a toxic relationship ends. If a toxic relationship ends and both of you grow and heal and you're happy in your own space and then you meet again, I'm not a big fan of fast intimacy. I'm a fan of, hey, let's go on a date Wednesday night. That was a fun date. Would you like to go out on Saturday night too? Yes, I would. Great. Let's go out on Saturday night. Would you like to go out on Thursday night now? No, I, I'm going to skip Thursday and let's go out um, next week. Okay, great. And what you do is you get to find out what motivates them. What motivates the person to want to reconnect with you? Is it motivating to them that they are just spending time with you? Is that a, a nice thing? Because spending time with you is, you know, 98% of the equation. And that spending time together is a wonderful thing. But at the same time, you're not overexposed to each other. And you're not going straight for what might be the underlying motivation, which is intimacy with this person was awesome. I want to have that again. Let me isolate her and get that intimacy so I can get what I want. And then I can turn into the jerk I was earlier. I'm not saying I see this at all. Mary, I do not see this in your letter to me. I don't like the isolation, like I said. I don't like that, hey, in order to build this relationship back up again, let's go out together and be somewhere alone. I am I think it's okay when you incrementally build it up. I just don't like the idea of, okay, let's stuff all this in three days and see if we're compatible again and see what happens. It could work perfectly. I don't want to deny you this. If you feel comfortable with it, go for it. As long as you understand that, you will probably be isolated. And if things don't work out well, what is your game plan? So make that game plan. If you do plan on doing this, make that game plan. Hey, if I see this old behavior, how do I get out of here? How do I leave? Can I take a cab or do I have to get airfare? You need to have a plan. And it's funny because um, when I first met my girlfriend, one of the things she worried about is she came up to New Hampshire and she could not believe that she planned to be with me in a hotel for the first time after meeting me physically. I mean, we talked on the phone for months. She got to know me. She got to know everything about me. And we had just really connected. And I built a level of trust with her. And she built a huge level of trust with me because she said, I've never done this. And I would never do this with anyone else. Meaning, meeting me at a hotel and staying with me that night at the hotel. And I said, I totally understand. Plus, she has a, a background of uh, child sexual abuse. So she already has a distrust of people in general, but mostly men. So for us to have that connection, it's so different when you meet physically after you haven't ever met, uh, but you've talked on the phone for all this time. For her to do that, it was a big risk for her, but she just felt safe enough to meet me, thankfully, because it all worked out. But we we met and we did spend that night in a hotel. I'm not going to tell you any of the details. <laughs> That's between her and I. But we met, we got along great, we ate dinner, we spent the night in the hotel. Everything was perfect. But the thing is, I wanted to make sure that she felt okay doing this by giving her an escape clause. I wanted her to feel okay that she wasn't stuck with me just in case we didn't get along. You know, you meet someone physically for the first time and, oh, I didn't know this about you or, oh, I'm just not feeling the vibe. I'm not getting a good energetic connection with you. Anything can happen. So we talked about this extensively. She goes, I don't know if I want to do this. And I said, well, I'll tell you what. 
uh, where were you going to go anyways? Because she didn't necessarily come up to see me only. She was going to meet her old college friends and meet up with them. And I said, hey, while you're up here, let's just connect and we can stay here and I can bring you up there and uh, you can meet with them. So she had sort of an alternate plan already, which was great because uh, that was half of the reason that she felt a little bit better. But the other half of the reason that she felt better is the conversation we had regarding, okay, if we meet and there's no sparks and you feel funny and it doesn't work, let's talk about an alternate plan for you. And she goes, that's a good idea. You know, my family lives about an hour north of where we're staying. And if it doesn't work out, you know, you can bring me to my family or my friend. I forget if we said family or friend, but she knew people. This was in New Hampshire. She knew people in New Hampshire because she lived there. And I said, great. So if we meet and it doesn't work out, I'll just drive you to New Hampshire. Or worst case scenario, you can take a cab. I'll even pay for it or a bus or something. And she was like, that makes me feel better. So this is what I'm saying is that having this escape clause or alternate plan just in case the isolation doesn't work. The isolation feels like a prison instead of a safe place to be yourself. That would make me feel better. That way, I'm not telling you what what to do. I'm not saying that you're not an adult and you can't make your own decisions. I'm just saying, let's just say that things don't go well. What are you going to do then? So just kind of have that thought in your mind. Even talk about it with him and see if he's okay with it. If he's like, oh, yeah, absolutely. In fact, here's what I've done. We can rent another room in the hotel and you can stay in there and I can stay. I mean, whatever plans come up. But I'd feel better if you had that conversation. And regarding the story with my girlfriend, uh, like I said, we met, we had connection. And from that point on, it still took her a year to trust me. (laughs) Not that I was untrustworthy, but because of her history of child sexual abuse and her history with men. So when we met, I'm I'm still not in her very tight nip of group of people that she trusts implicitly. That's when we met. But now, you know, it's a lot different. We get along great. So it absolutely can work. You can Um, meet up with him again and find out that there are sparks and that there is an emotional connection, there's emotional health, there's emotional intelligence, there's other things that you liked like when you were in the relationship and everything works out. So I don't want to belabor the point of isolation anymore, but you get where I'm coming from there. The other point I wanted to make with you uh, regarding this email has to do with how I treated my wife. Like you asked, uh, is it really possible for someone to change Or do you think that he's just saying what I want to hear? Do you think we could go back to a new relationship and make it work? And because of the way you treated your wife, how did that work for you? And, you know, so on and so on. And just for the people that haven't heard this story, when I was married several years ago, many years ago, I was emotionally abusive to my wife. I don't like admitting that. I think it immediately labels me and I think that people are judging me. So it doesn't feel very good when I say that. At the same time... I realized it about a year before our relationship ended. I realized I was emotionally abusive. I didn't even know emotional abuse was a term back then, but I realized it because after we separated, I had all these thoughts about how I was treating her, and I realized, geez, I'm not supporting her being happy. I just want her to do what I want her to do. I don't want her to eat junk food. I was highly judgmental about her emotional eating which was a problem for her that she was dealing with, but I made it my problem. So I became highly judgmental and I didn't want her to gain weight and I would try to control her. And I was an awful person in so many ways. I was a nice person in some ways, but it didn't matter because when you bring in this awfulness, this high judgment, and um, also the emotionally abusive aspect of the silent treatment and uh, passive aggressiveness and other things I was doing in the marriage, I was really making her feel bad about herself. And that is like the key of emotional abuse when you make someone feel bad about themselves. I'm going to make her feel bad about her being authentically her. It's like somebody comes up to you and says, I'm going to make you feel bad about you being you. You can't get out of that. There's no way out. It's a binding situation. That's what I was doing to my wife. So when she decided to separate, to work on our marriage, I mean, the separation was actually to work on our marriage. She realized when she was gone that, oh, I fell out of love with you. I learned that many months later when we talked on uh, video chat. 
and she said, I, I'm just not in love with you anymore. I was like, really? And even though she saw the changes in me, I went through a lot of healing and I, I realized that, that all my judgments were hurting her and I had to go through my own process of getting over those judgments and getting out of the emotional abuse. I did not support her happiness. I supported mine. I wanted to control her instead of have self-control for me. I didn't have compassion for her. I just wanted to make sure she did what I wanted her to do so that I would be happy. That was her challenge being married to me. Again, I'm not proud of it, and I felt awful when I realized this about myself, but I've gone through a lot of healing, a lot of changes, and what Mary is asking is, hey, you went through these changes. You made it to the other side. Is it possible that he made it to the other side? Is it possible that he is in a better space? Or is he just telling me what I want to hear? My first inclination from your letter is he it sounds like he made it into a better space but i'm going to share this with you and i don't know if i've shared this on the air or not before but i think i have a little bit after i uh, healed from my judgments um, i started focusing on myself instead of focusing on her and what she needed to do to change for me i just focused on myself and what i needed to do to honor myself to love myself to be the best person i can and also love people by supporting their path, their happiness, without controlling them. Anytime I felt a controlling behavior come up, I would question that and ask myself, am I trying to control her? And I would have to back up. And it was a constant process because it was so ingrained in me. So I did get to a point where I healed a lot, but not fully. So I healed from my emotional abuse toward her. I did stop doing that, and she saw these changes. Before we got divorced, she said, you know, I'm seeing these changes, and I love them, but I'm just not in love with you anymore. So it came at the wrong time, or the right time, depending how you look at it, because I'm in a great relationship now, but it came at a time where it just didn't line up when she still loved me. So these changes happened in me, but she wasn't um, available at that time. But what I'm here to say is that even though I went through major changes and I pretty much lost most of my judgments, I still had little bits here and there. And they were old triggers, old patterns, old neurological pathways inside of me that existed that hadn't been addressed yet. There were many facets to it. Many were from childhood, from the dysfunctions back then, you know, wanting to be perfect in front of my alcoholic stepfather, wanting to be super responsible, and then putting all of these self-imposed regulations onto others, which turns into judgments about their behavior, about their choices in life. So I, I still had those old programs in me. When they came up, if I didn't stop them, from being a judgment, they would come out as a judgment and hurt someone. And so I really had to be self-aware and continually check in with myself. Even several months after we separated, my wife and I separated, these little judgments still kicked in. And because of that, it showed that I still had work to do. And that is important to remember, is that when you go through a healing process, there's some old patterns that could still lie dormant in there, and then one day you get a reminder. There's some stimuli that activates that pattern. It triggers you, and suddenly you're in that old behavior again. You could be 98% gray, and that 2% gets activated, and suddenly you're the same person you were, and you're like, what the heck? Where is this coming from? That's what I went through. Where is this coming from? What the heck is going on? So I had to find out about these old behaviors month after month after year, and even now, even now, an old behavior comes up in me, and I have to recognize, I have to be aware that it's happening in me so that I can explore it, so I can process it, so I can ask myself, where is this coming from? When did this start? I go through the drill-down process I've talked about in other episodes. Why is this being activated? What is causing this inside of me? Why am I being triggered about that behavior? Why is that behavior such a problem to me? all these questions that I ask myself so that I don't repeat and continue to repeat behavior that doesn't serve anyone, me or her or anyone in the world, because it's an old controlling pattern, an old controlling behavior. 
So, Mary, what I'm saying to you is that seven months is not a lot of time. It could be enough time. It could be the perfect amount of time. He he may have had an enlightening moment. He may have had a, an amazing transformation, and he is absolutely a different person. In the next segment, one of the uh, 10 items I'm going to share with you has to do with finding out if any of those old patterns are still there. And if they are, how strong are they and how much of a problem will they be? If and when they do show up in the relationship again, who will you be and who will he be when it happens? Because if an old trigger comes up and it incites some old argument and now you're in that same space you were, it could be something that if you're both aware that it could happen, that you could both talk about it and get through it and perhaps get to a new level with it and then put it behind you. The only thing is he hasn't been with you for several months, which means the stimuli that you used to activate his patterns hasn't been present. And what that means for you is that when you are reintroduced into his life, that stimuli is back. It's a good test and it's a challenge. So keep this in mind when you are reconnecting with him. And also after the next segment, you'll have a lot more to consider and think about as you continue communicating with him, trying to figure out if this is the right move for you. Thanks for writing, Mary. More to come next segment. Be right back. So I keep hearing from people who purchased the Mean Workbook, even people that purchased it a year and a half ago. I, I think it came out like almost two years ago. It might have been a year and a half. But uh, people who have taken the assessment, the 200-point assessment in there and gave me their score. And some of these scores, I just, I bite my lip. They're just really big scores. They're in one of the four categories, class A through D. And D is like the top most severe case of emotional abuse and manipulation. It's always scary to see, but uh, these people didn't know they were in the situation they were in and they would share the score with me and it highlighted and cleared everything up for them. This made me feel good because they finally get to pinpoint the behaviors that are causing them to pull their hair out. But at the same time, it is now something very clear cut that they can do something with and they need to do something with. They can't allow the relationship to continue at that uh, level. They need to either work with their partner to heal through it, which is possible. It's harder when it's a higher score or figure out a way to start planning an escape or an exit out of the relationship. Like I was talking about with Mary in the last uh, segment where if she's isolated away from her friends and family and she's stuck with him and things don't work out. What's her exit strategy? What's her escape plan? And that's what I talk about in the Mean Workbook, but it's not only about getting away from someone that abuses you. I just want you to get away from the emotional abuse, the verbal abuse, the manipulation, the deception, the lies. That needs to stop. That can't be in a relationship in order for a relationship to be healthy. So the Mean Workbook highlights what isn't healthy and pinpoints the exact behaviors. It'll be very clear exactly what's going on in your relationship if you're experiencing anything like this. And the way to tell you if you even need the workbook is just ask yourself, am I more happy in the relationship than not? If you're more happy than in the relationship than not, then you may or may not be experiencing emotional abuse, but perhaps it's not enough to consider getting the workbook or maybe you just want to clarify a few things. So you take the assessment and you figure out, oh, this is happening. This is happening. This would be great to work on with my partner because hopefully you have a healthy partner that wants to work on things with you. But if you're less happy than you are happy in your relationship and you especially don't know why, then it's time to, to really seriously consider figuring out what it is. That's what the workbook does. You know, I got an email the other day. I just want to read it to you. It's amazing. This woman wrote, I just wanted to reach out and thank you for making the mean workbook. I first purchased it about a year and a half ago and I started to very seriously consider that something was wrong with my relationship. The workbook and the quiz was so clear-cut and concise 
that it really left no room for doubt. She told me some other things, but I don't want to share it all here. But she said, I'm pretty blown away by how quickly I've healed and how much better my life is. You know, I showed that to my girlfriend and I was just so touched. Not because, hey, I made this workbook and it's helping people, but because she had the strength and the clarity of mind to take steps for herself, to take the right steps that she needed to take. And when I showed my girlfriend this, we both just felt so grateful that she was able to take these steps for her. So to the person who wrote this, I'm, I am so happy that you shared this with me and I'm so grateful that you are in a better space today. And this is what the workbook's all about. I want you to be in a better space today, whether you choose to stay in the relationship or not. If you want to find out exactly what's going on in your relationship, if you're not sure if you're being manipulated or emotionally abused, go to loveandabuse.com, download the Mean Workbook, and take the assessment and um, start down the road of making the changes that will be the best and the healthiest for both of you. Loveandabuse.com. All right, welcome back. Today's episode is about second chances. Do we give someone a second chance? What should we look for when giving them a second chance? Let's just say that you are facing this opportunity right now and you want to know what to look for. This is similar to the um, episode I did last week on what to look for when starting a new relationship. You know, it's the holidays when this is being recorded, so there might be people in your life that want to reconnect. Who are they going to be? Are they going to be uh, that toxic person that you remember? And is it going to be the awful relationship that you had with them or that topsy-turvy roller coaster relationship? Uh, Let's find out. (laughs) Let's go through this list that I created. And uh, this will give you my one to 10 of what to look for when you're considering giving someone a second chance. The first thing is an apology a good start. (laughs) And that's the easiest one because you usually get it. I mean, if somebody wants to reconnect, they're going to apologize. I hope they don't apologize. They haven't even passed the first simple step. When they do though, when they apologize, make sure it comes with an affirmation of their role in the breakdown. Make sure that they're taking responsibility for what they did. So the apology has to accompany their role. Like, I'm so sorry for what I did. You know, I realize I did this to you and I feel awful about it. That's an affirmation of their role. They're they're affirming to you that they did something and they admit it. Okay, that's the first step. If they can pass that step, great. But they have some more criteria to fulfill here. So let's get to the next one. Number two, they tell you the steps they have taken to resolve the problem they had. Not the steps they will take in the future, only the steps they have already taken and maybe even taking now. So what does that mean? It means if they hurt your feelings or if they've betrayed you, whatever part they played in the breakdown of the communication or the relationship, you need to know that they went through some sort of self-growth or healing. You need to be convinced that they know they did wrong in some way. And that they also don't want to show up that way ever again. So, for example, I told you the story of my wife when I told her, you know, I realized what I did. I realized I was so judgmental towards you. And I feel so bad about it. I'm so sorry I did that. So there's the affirmation of my responsibility, my role, and the apology. And I also said, you know, I've been working on myself. I realized that I've been so focused on you instead of doing what I need to do for me. I was trying to control you and I didn't know I was doing this until we were separated and now I see it clearly so I completely understand what was happening. And I've been working on myself. I've been buying books. I've been doing self-help programs and I made it clear that that's what I was doing. I was physically doing things. I should have even gone to therapy. I should have done that, but I didn't. You know, this is in hindsight. And I wasn't saying this knowing that she'd fall for it or anything like that. It wasn't a ploy. It was true. I actually was working on myself. I totally realized how judgmental I've been and how much I was trying to control her. And I also proved that by our interactions continually from that point on. And she noticed it. 
You have to notice this. And it can't be something that they try to convince you of. You just have to be convinced by their behavior overall. So it's tough when they are, they're telling you, I've made changes, because you're not sure if that's true or not. You can only see it in their behavior, in their actions. So this is something that might take a little while. They need to continue showing up as the person they say they are becoming or have become in a more healed, a more new and improved version of themselves. So there's another one. They tell you the steps they have taken, not the ones they will take. And that's an important distinction. I promise I'll go to therapy. I promise I'll make changes. You got to throw those out the window. Those haven't happened and it's not real until it's real. Throw those out the window. Anything in the future, I promise I'll do this. I promise I'll change. I promise I'll treat you better. Just throw them out the window. There, you, The jury needs to disregard that sentence and pretend they never heard it because it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist until it exists. So there's number two. Number three is they want to reconnect, but they're willing to let you go if that's what you want. I think that's a very important one because when someone cares about you, they want the best for you. And if you believe the best for you is to be without them, they need to honor that in you. They need to be ready to put their hands up and walk away and say, okay, I will stay away, whatever you want. What's good about this one is that you get to separate those who are just telling you what you want to hear and those who will actually leave you alone. The ones who leave you alone will be there if you want to talk, will be there if you're ready to, to reach out to them. But they're ready to walk away because they know that's what you want. They are supporting what you want. So when someone comes to you and wants to reconnect, wants to rekindle, wants to uh, have a second chance, they need to be willing to let you go if that's what you want. So there's number three. Number four is... They absolutely, positively never tell you to get over it or put it behind you. You know, I talk about emotional abuse a lot. I know you're probably sick of it. <laughs> the idea, the reason I do is because we're all capable of doing it and sometimes we don't even know it. But one of the components of emotional abuse is in order for me to get away with my bad behavior, I want you to get over it. In other words, I don't want to have to go heal myself. I just want you to accept my bad behavior. I want you to accept it, get over it, so that we can move on with our relationship. That is not healthy. That is not good. And that isn't even their decision to make. It's yours. You should never listen to someone that says, you need to get over it. You need to put it in your past. I need you to wipe that away too. When someone tells you to get over it, put it behind you, uh-uh. That's them trying to control you so that you're in a different space to forget their bad behavior so they can probably repeat that bad behavior. This is why number one, two, and three are so important. You need to make sure that these criteria are in place because someone who cares about you and wants your happiness and absolutely takes responsibility for their behavior isn't going to tell you to get over it. Now, the only caveat here is let's just say there has been a betrayal in the relationship. I talk about this with infidelity. Uh, one partner cheats on the other, and then they decide to work it out. They decide to work on it, and the partner who cheated is truly apologetic, and he or she is doing everything they possibly can to show the other person that I am responsible, I am at fault, I am working on myself, I am willing to show you everything. I'm showing you my phones, my emails. I'm willing to do everything possible to show you that I can be trusted again, but I am on your schedule when you're ready. Let's just say that eight months goes by, nine, 10, 12 months. I like to put out like a 12 month limit. Let's just say that was happening for 12 months. The person who cheated has done everything they possibly can. They feel bad, they feel guilty, it's very clear, and their life is transparent to the person who didn't cheat now, to their partner. And it's clear that they've done everything possible and they really do feel bad and they really do want to save this relationship. When that happens for about a year, there's a point where the person who cheated has to be let off the hook. 
Only if that took place, though, only if this whole thing of them being transparent and trying and never telling you to put it behind you, never telling you to get over it, they're always on your schedule and they're proving in every possible way that they absolutely feel bad, that they feel terrible, that they know they made a mistake and it'll never happen again and they promise it'll never happen again. I know sometimes we hear that and it's not true, but that all these criteria have to be in place so that you know that they are doing everything possible. There's a point where you do have to let them go. There's a point where they can stop feeling guilty and you can move on because if you don't stop feeling guilty and if you don't move on from it, if you don't put it behind you and start the relationship anew, start it up again so that you can create a new foundation of trust, then the relationship doesn't go too far. In fact, it's just there's too much pain for the relationship to continue. So that's the only caveat. When somebody keeps showing up in a way that proves that they really are trustworthy now, that they really have changed, that their life is an open book to you, there is a point in time where you can finally put it behind you. I'm not saying that it, there won't still be painful moments. I'm just saying that there's a point where you just can't continue to hold them responsible, continue yelling at them, continue making them feel bad and making them feel guilty because hopefully you are rebuilding the foundation, working with each other instead of one person pointing the finger at another the whole time. So listen to a few episodes I did on infidelity to explore that even further. But that's the only caveat to number four, which is they absolutely positively never tell you to get over it or put it behind you. All other times, you have to be very careful when you hear that, that somebody saying, just get over my bad behavior. You're ridiculous. Get over my bad behavior so we can move on and I can do whatever I want. That's what I hear. <laughs> All right, the number five thing to look for when you're considering giving someone a second chance is they want you back and they seem happier than before. So this isn't like a hard and fast rule, but what I've seen is when there's a disconnect, when there's a breakup, when there's a separation, that when you are truly working on yourself, when you are focused on yourself, when you aren't so focused on getting someone else back in your life and you're more focused on, I really need to improve myself, I really need to heal, you generally become a little bit happier or a lot. You generally start feeling good about yourself in yourself because you're so focused on you. So this is a good sign. Someone's coming to you and they say, you know, I really, I really would like to talk about getting together again. Or maybe you reach out to them and you find out through conversation that they're, they're living their life. They're doing things for them. They're feeling good. They're going out and enjoying their life. But if the conversation's all about, oh, I miss you so much and all I want is you and all I think about is you and I still have our pictures up, throw those out the window. <laughs> I'm being a little harsh today, but throw anything out the window that sounds like that you are their source of happiness and source of fulfillment in their life. Because if you take someone back that's all about you, then that's not healed. That's not a place that you want them to be. You want them to feel good about themselves in themselves and then take this happy, healthier person that you're reconnecting with and share your time with them. You don't want to share time with someone who immediately becomes an energy drain. You don't want to do that. So I think that's a good sign to look for, aside from all these others, that uh, if they seem a little or a lot happier in their life and they're moving forward with their life, then they're probably not obsessing about you. They may still think of you. They may miss you. They may even love you. But they know that you want to move on with your life, so they've left you alone. And leaving you alone also means that they are focusing on themselves and what they want in their life. So that's a healthy thing. I like seeing that as one of the signs to look for when you're considering giving someone a second chance. Let's take a quick break, and then when I come back, I'll do 6 through 10 after this. <music> All right, I just realized I thought I had 10. I actually have nine. <laughs> so these are the nine signs to look for when you're considering giving someone a second chance. Sorry about that. I thought I had 10 on my list, but um, I had nine. I couldn't think of a 10th one. I'm sure there's one out there. Maybe I'll 
come up with it later. <laughs> We've gone through one to five. Let's go to the number six sign to look for when you're considering giving someone a second chance. Uh, number six is they don't beg. <laughs> now hear me out. Begging can be a sign of control and manipulation. They beg because they hope you'll feel sorry for them. They hope you'll feel guilty or that your compassion will kick in or something will activate in you so that you'll want to reconnect with them. This is such a dangerous way to reconnect. You should never reconnect because you feel sorry for someone. That is obligation. That is feeling like you owe them something. You should never get back together with someone because you feel like you owe them. Be very careful here. You should only reconnect because you've seen their changes and you like what you see. And you are willing to cautiously yet optimistically give it another chance. But never reconnect because you think they're a victim or you feel guilty. Only reconnect with someone that is actually doing the work. The uh, what I call victim reconnect often happens when they want you to feel bad for them. Reconnecting when they're in the victim mode is not good because it's not for the right reasons. You should only reconnect because you are both healthier. Not when one or both of you need compassionate coddling or pity. You have to be really, really careful when someone begs you. Now, I'm not saying this is every single scenario ever. Like, you could have an employee come back to an office and beg to get their job. I'm so sorry, I won't do it again. I promise I won't do it again. And they may be sincere. And you can have someone come back to a relationship and say, I'm so sorry, you're right, you're right. I, I would never do it again. I'll never do it again. I promise, I promise, I promise. And they absolutely can be sincere. But don't only base it on that. I don't want you to reconnect because they begged, because your compassion kicked in, because they seemed sincere. You need to see the changes. You need to see that they are healthy. And you need to like what you see. If you like to see a begging, groveling, uh, sad, pathetic person on their knees looking up at you, that might be something that makes you feel good. Like, ha, finally, they're looking up to me and I feel whatever, righteous uh, or good about myself now that they have admitted that they're wrong. But you have to be careful because even in that space, reconnecting with someone who's playing that victim or is that victim is often their hope that you'll feel bad enough to feel obligated to get back in a relationship with them. So if they beg, beware. The number seven sign to look for when you're thinking about giving someone a, a second chance is when you say no to them, do they do a complete 180? Are they a completely different person? Do they go from happy and connected to upset, angry, and even vindictive? What I mean that is that they come to you and say, oh, let's, let's get back together. Let's go to lunch. And you say, look, I will never get back together with you. You're so toxic. And then they go, well, you're just a B word. And I, I never really loved you anyway. They get reactive. They get angry. This is a big red flag. When you say no, a caring and supportive person will understand it and let you go. No, I don't want to deal with you again. The caring, supportive, honest person is going to go, okay, you know, I understand. It. I'm, I'm sad about that. I hope you change your mind. But if you ever want to talk, you know, reach out to me. And the caring, kind, supportive, honest person is going to walk away and allow you to be. That's great. But if they say, well, I never liked you anyway, and you're such a B word, and I'm, I hope you crash and burn. I hope you realize that no one's ever going to love you. If they say all these mean, intimidating things to you, then you know what you're dealing with. The word no always gives you an opportunity to observe behavior, to find out if the person that you're talking to has truly changed. Or are they going to make you feel bad for honoring yourself? Because that's what's happening. If you say, no way, I will never go out with you again. I will never, I never want to be near you again, which is you honoring yourself, standing up for what you want in your life, and they don't appreciate you honoring yourself, Huge red flag. You, you don't want to be near someone who does that kind of 180 because that was already in there. That was not supportive of you. That was more selfish of them. I might get some flack for that <laughs> because we may have all reacted that way to something in our life. 
what they said no to me after all I've done for them. You stupid, I can't stand you. And suddenly it's um, an anger that came out of us and we realize, oh crap, why did I say that? I shouldn't have said that. Oh, this is just one component of many. You got to put the big picture together, but I don't like to see when you say no to someone, they have an adverse reaction that really shows what's going on underneath that could have been part of a deeper issue inside of them that they wanted to control you or they wanted what they wanted but didn't care about what you wanted. So that's number seven. We got two more. Thought we had three more, but we have two more. The, the number eight sign to look for when you're considering giving someone a second chance is that they're not stalking you or breadcrumbing you. I talked about breadcrumbing in a very recent episode, but um, there's a stocky, stalking type behavior that you need to be very careful about in people because they become obsessed about you when they show up where you are when they're quote just driving by or when they leave clues to their presence in your life to make you think of them whether through texting or them sending you old pictures of good times to make you feel good about them today if they seem to be spending an awful lot of time thinking of you reaching out to you showing up where you are like i said you might be dealing with someone who's obsessing over you and you don't want to reconnect with someone who's obsessive because now it's all about what they want and nothing about what you want. Someone who's obsessed over you, it doesn't matter what you want. They just want you to want them. Just want me. Just want me back in your life. You have to be really careful with obsessive people because they're not convinced that you're not right for them. They're not convinced that you don't want to be with them until you convince them. You do have to convince someone that's obsessed with you uh, not in an easy way, but in a very bold, sometimes cold, awful way. There's a difference between saying, no, I, I don't want to be with you. No, we're not good together. No, it's everything's very passive. You know, I don't, I don't think it's right. And there's a lot of passiveness to how I'm saying that. No, it, it, I don't think it's a good idea. That's so passive. With people that continually want you to want them and they're obsessed and they're following you and they're texting you and they're doing everything they can to show you that they want this relationship really bad, you need to be cold, bold, and awful. You need to say, no way. I don't want anything to do with you ever. I never want to see you again. You make me sick. You might have to do this. I'm not saying you use those exact words. I'm saying you have to get very clear. If you don't want them in your life, you be very clear and say, go away. I never want to see you again, ever. And if they don't listen, you go full no contact. You block them in every way you can. You block them on phone. You block them on social media. You change your phone number if you have to. You do everything you can to show them you have absolutely no interest. Because obsessed people love breadcrumbs. Now, I talked about breadcrumbing in another episode where someone texts you out of the blue saying, hey, I hope you had a great day. And you just broke up three days ago and you were, had a big fight, but they don't mention the fight. But they want you to think about them and they want you to think that everything is cool. So what they do is they put a breadcrumb out there hoping you'll bite because you'll probably respond to the text, oh, I'm fine. And that means that you bit. That means that you're not worried about the past anymore. And then we can move on with this relationship and I can probably uh, hurt you again or whatever. As long as I make you continue thinking about me, I'm breadcrumbing you. So this is what breadcrumbing is about. They, they might text you, they might email you, they might call you once every few days, once every few weeks, once every few months. But it always seems to involve not mentioning what is still a problem they just bypass the problem and say, hey, I hope you have a great birthday. And parenthetically, they're saying, I want you to continue thinking of me. And I want you to think I'm a great person. So I'm going to send this little message out to you and hope that you pick up that breadcrumb so that you continue to follow me and continue to think of me so I can use you as a backup plan uh, so we can get together someday. You heard me on another episode say, don't be a backup plan. You don't want that breadcrumb. Now, what I'm talking about here is when they stalk you and they breadcrumb you, they're always trying to keep you interested in them, but it can also work in reverse. If you still care about them, you might have a tendency to breadcrumb them. You might have a tendency to reach out and go, I hope you're okay, or how are you feeling since, the, since you got fired? 
even though you don't want any contact with them. It's like you don't want the relationship, but you feel so bad for them or you feel pity for them or you feel sorry for them that you put a breadcrumb out there and keep leading them on. I don't want you to get stuck in that trap either because your compassion can kick in and then you can inadvertently breadcrumb toxicity into your life by doing this. This is why it's sometimes the best plan is to be cold, bold, and awful and just say, no way, I never want to see you again. And when you do the no contact thing and you cut them out of your life completely, they get the picture. They have no way to reach you. And then finally, the obsession in them can start to calm because they have no way to reach you and they start reinforcing that not only do you not want to see them, but you're also hard to reach and you have been adamant in your desire to never see them again. It may not be what you really feel, but if they're obsessing, if they're continuing to trail you and track you and want you, you just need to be cold, bold, and awful. Uh, so I might have lost the point here. <laughs> the um, When you want to give someone a second chance, if they're stalking you and breadcrumbing you, those are the kind of people that you have to be really careful about because they're obsessive and you don't want to get into a relationship or any type of connection with the obsessive person because that almost always leads to a dysfunctional relationship. All right, let's get to number nine, the very last one. The very last sign to look for when you're considering giving someone a second chance is that they give you affirming answers when you ask them about the events that disconnected you in the first place. Let me say that again. They give you affirming answers when you ask them about the events that disconnected you in the first place. What I mean by that is if they used to get angry about something you did, I want you to rub that wound with salt and see how they react. Now, my example here is when I was married and I was apologizing to my wife for my bad behavior and my judgments, and you know, because I had problems with her emotionally eating, I was not mature enough, I didn't understand it, and I wanted what I wanted, I wanted to control her, I was definitely emotionally abusive toward her. So if she wanted to take me back, if she said, you know, I still love you and I do want to take you back, a great line of questioning for her to me would have been, well, what if I buy a box of donuts and eat the whole thing in front of you? How would you feel? Would it be a problem? Now, what she's doing is trying to reactivate that trigger in me. That would have been a great, great question. And I don't know how I would have responded then because I was still going through my healing, but it would have been a great test. It would have been a great challenge for me. Or if she said, what if I eat pancakes and whipped cream every morning? What if I just stopped eating vegetables? What if all I ate were chips and dip every night and pancakes every morning? How are you going to react when you wake up and see a five stack on my plate? <laughs> How will you feel? And for me to try that on and not just quickly answer, oh, I'd be great. Oh, everything would be fine. You don't want those quick answers. You want them to contemplate. You want them to actually consider how they'd feel because it's that important. So think about the things, think about the events that happened in the relationship that caused the disconnect in the first place and bring them up and open those wounds as, as wide as you can and pour salt on them and try to trigger their old reaction. Find out where they are with it. And this will be a great test, a great challenge, because if they go, wow, you know, I guess if you did that, I would have to think about it really hard, then they're still working on it. I'm not saying it automatically disqualifies them, but if they're honest enough to say, wow, that probably would trigger me, uh, I do need to consider that. I, knew, I do need to think about that. Then you can have an honest conversation about it. But if they immediately go, oh, no, no, that wouldn't bother me at all. It, I guess it could be true. But I just want you to watch for those quick responses, those quick reactions, because I don't want somebody to say what you want to hear. I want them to really consider it. And then you can re-ask it. So you're saying that you would have no problem at all if I just got a box of chocolates out and I ate the whole thing. You know, in my case, you know, you ask them again and find out if they're still in the same place. And um, that, along with all the eight other signs, might give you a really clear picture if this is a relationship worth revisiting. Is there a second chance possible here? I hope this helps. This was not an exhaustive list, but it's probably all the main points of reconnecting and giving someone a second chance. So I hope this helps in any situation that you're in, in any relationship that you're in, in any event where 
Uh, someone wants to come back into your life and you're not sure what to look for. Now you know. Be right back after this. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I want to remind you to go to loveandabuse.com if you're having a challenging relationship that just doesn't seem to be getting any better. Perhaps there's something deeper underneath that maybe you should know about. Go to loveandabuse.com. And I want to thank two iTunes reviewers. One of them is Big Saka Playa <laughs> for saying that The Overwhelmed Brain is their go-to podcast and appreciates the way I speak directly to the issues that person's having. Thank you, big soccer player. I bet you play soccer. I don't know why I think that, but I just think that. <laughs> I also want to thank Brian Mully, who said the podcast has literally changed his life. The advice Paul gives is sound, safe, and applicable, and anyone suffering from anxiety and depression should listen daily. Thank you, Brian. I'm so glad to hear it changed your life, and um, I appreciate you for saying that. Thank you for reviewing the show. That means a lot to me. I also want to thank the people that leave comments. There's podcast aggregators out there like Podbean and CastBox and other ways to get your podcast. And I don't get to see all the comments. I'm not logged into these sites. But every now and then I'll look and I'll see a bunch of comments that I haven't replied to. And I just don't have time or the bandwidth to reply to these. But I want to let you know that I see them all. So if you've left a comment in one of these podcast places, like, thank you so much, I love your show, or I hate your show, <laughs> or whatever, uh, thank you. Thank you for that. I'm seeing these comments, and it really means a lot to me. So I appreciate that. And I also want to thank patron members that are supporting the show over at patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com. The patron site is a great way to show your support, to say thank you, and also to get some bonus extras. I, I have over 90 episodes now, I believe, in the patron program that you've never heard. If you're not part of the patron program, if you've never been part of it, there's 90 private episodes that get into some deeper topics, get into some other topics, answer emails that I won't read on the air here. Uh, so it might be informational, educational, and even fun for you to go through those Plus, there's the free workbooks. Some of them are addendums. Some of them are full workbooks. I even have the, the Overwhelmed Brain book in PDF format in there. It's all over at patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com. And I also want to thank um, Sarah for joining the program recently. Hello, Sarah. I appreciate you. And Amy for her continued patronage to the show and so many other patron supporters. I appreciate you all. You're definitely part of the backbone that keeps this thing running. And let me tell you about the safe empowerment system for social anxiety. We didn't talk about anxiety at all in this episode, but I guarantee you it comes along with any type of relationship that makes you hesitate, that makes you question, that makes you doubt. Like my girlfriend probably had anxiety about meeting me for the first time after talking to me on the phone for months and months and uh, not knowing if I was actually who I said I was. The Safe Empowerment System for Social Anxiety is something that's coming out in January where I have collaborated with several experts, several social anxiety experts, on how to not only help you diminish social anxiety, but maybe even get rid of it altogether. And I'm including a special set of emergency pods that you can just slip into your ears. I mean, they're just audio files that you play while you're in the midst, while you're in the moment of social anxiety. And um, some of the pods are one of the experts guiding you out of social anxiety. Some of them are me guiding you out of social anxiety. But no matter what, what it starts to do is retrain your brain so that when you're in a moment of anxiety in a social setting, that as you experience more and more social settings, your anxiety should decrease, should get less and less. That's the hope. That's the plan. That's the reason I designed this system. I don't know anything else out there that's like this. So I'm hoping that it reaches you. If you have social anxiety and the millions of people that suffer with social anxiety, I know this is going to be very beneficial for you and all of them as well. If you want more information on that um, and even sign up to get a discount before it's released, go to theoverwhelmedbrain.com forward slash safe, S-A-F-E. And finally, I'd like to thank Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com for some of the music transitions in The Overwhelmed Brain. 
And just to end the show really quick, I'm going to read you a short email that is a little bit associated with everything we're talking about today. Uh, This person wrote and said, hey, I found your podcast earlier in the year. And as a time poor mom, I'm working on that. I found that my commute to work three days a week was a great time to do some personal development. I love starting out my work week listening to you on a Tuesday morning, and you're my go-to podcast when I need a pick-me-up, inspiration, answers, etc. I recently found out my husband has been having an affair with an old girlfriend slash friend. After the initial shock, crying and wine drinking with friends, I thought, I bet Paul has done an episode on infidelity. So I searched old podcasts, and lo and behold, there was one. And I've also been reading a lot to figure out how we get to this place. On a positive note, it has been the shakeup that we needed to get our relationship back on track. And we have been seeing a great counselor and, quote, doing the work. So anyway, this is just a big thank you for what you do. I hope you have a great holiday season and I look forward to listening in 2019. Kind regards. I want to thank you so much for writing that. I want to call you Sharon. Sharon, uh, that is amazing and it's you know it's bittersweet i know the heartache the heartbreak the betrayal the infidelity that's like the worst like in my first article about infidelity i called it emotional murder it feels like your emotions are murdered if you've ever experienced infidelity and you want to start healing from it i highly recommend you go to the overwhelmedbrain.com and you look in the search field for uh, surviving infidelity And you'll see uh, an article called Surviving Infidelity, An Overlooked Warning Sign, and Healing After the Cheating. I have like, I don't know, 80 comments on that article. It's a very big article. It's a very informative article. And it usually hits spot on with people going through infidelity on both sides. And it's all about helping you get to a better space and healing the relationship, whether the relationship is something that continues or not helping heal the individuals in the relationship and then making the choice to separate or not. And uh, that's so important. But I wanted to read this email. Thank you again, Sharon. This was amazing. I'm so glad that you're seeing counseling. And yeah, sometimes it takes a huge breakdown to reach a breakthrough in your relationship. So I'm so glad this breakthrough is happening for you. And you're going to learn so much more about yourselves. And You know, if all goes well, you're going to build such a solid, stronger, more trusting foundation than ever. That can happen. And I read this email because it does have to do with taking someone back and it does have to do with second chances. So this fits right in line with that. When you go through some sort of falling out, when you go through some sort of big phase, big breakup, big disconnect, or in this case, a betrayal, Are you going to take the person back? And are they being sincere? You have to know if they're being sincere. So this episode is all about trying to figure out if they're being sincere. And if your efforts uh, of trying to rekindle, reconnect, reunite are going to be worth it. Or is it another waste of time and you're going to end up in another dysfunction or toxic situation or breakup or whatever. That's when you really need to consider your options. And The options I spoke of today are going to be very helpful in helping you decide, just like Sharon decided, just like the person who wrote that email, just like Mary is deciding in the earlier email, what am I going to do? Is this the right path? Is this the right direction? And um, hopefully this episode has helped you answer that. And if it hasn't, if you still have questions, if you're still concerned, if there's still more going on in your mind and it's still confusing you still don't know what you're going to do. All I ask is that you keep your mind open so that you can step into your power. When you have power, you have more clarity. This will help you be firm in whatever decision you make and whatever action you take. That way you can create the life you want. Always take steps to grow and evolve. You are powerful beyond measure. And above all, and this is something I absolutely know to be true, you are amazing.
Let's go through 6 through 10. Oh, man. Let's go through 6 through 9. 